Welcome to our last full session of this workshop, and thank you for attending. My name is Anne Maglia, and I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research and Integrity at the University of Massachusetts Lowell here in the United States. And I'm also the co-chair of the planning committee for this workshop and an ILAR council member. For this last regular session of the workshop, we'll be doing something slightly different. In lieu of presentations, I'll be moderating a panel of some of uh, discussing some of the bigger challenges we've covered in the last two days. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to the workshop panel uh, planning committee, the ILAR Council, uh, the ILAR Roundtable, the National Academy staff, and especially to Eric Edkin, our workshop tech guru, who has done a great job coordinating and directing our virtual event. And thank you in advance to our panel discussants for this session. Uh, we have Michael Stopskoff from North Carolina State Universities, all, uh, also a planning committee member. Uh, we have Bob Sykes, who is from the University of Arkansas Little Rock and uh, the co-chair of the planning committee. And Bill Greer from the University of Michigan and also a, a member of the planning committee. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and for our audience, please feel free to type in questions or comments for our panelists, and we'll try to get to the, as many of them as we can uh, during the broadcast of this presentation. And so uh, with that, uh, gentlemen, I think we'll begin, and I'm going to start with a question for Bob. So Bob, one of the key issues that's become apparent in this workshop is the inconsistency in the use of key terminology related to wildlife research. And this has led to a misunderstanding and miscommunications uh, uh, in, the, in the community. So can you talk a little bit about this and maybe give us a few examples of, of how this miscommunication and misunderstanding has happened because of this? Sure thing. The first two examples that I've, or the two examples that I mentioned in my opening session really are at the core of this, the term field studies and the term euthanasia. The term field studies has common usage among field biologists to differentiate between studies that are conducted in a controlled laboratory environment versus those that are conducted in nature. But this term has a very specific regulatory definition within the Animal Welfare Act regs as a study that's conducted on animals in their natural environment with the additional requirements that it not be invasive, cause harm, or materially alter the behavior of the animals under study. Studies that do not meet these specific requirements are covered activities by the USDA, which imposes an additional set of requirements for those studies. Examples for the qualifiers of invasive, harm, and material alteration of, of behavior are provided in the recent USDA tech note, but these examples and these terms still leave much room for interpretation. Now, in some respects, this particular term is a non-issue because many, perhaps most institutions conducting these types of research with wild animals would require submission of sufficient information, if not a full protocol, to make an informed decision as to whether or not the study and the activities meet those restrictive terms. In fact, I'll tell you that this is an issue that the American Society of Mammalogists emphasizes in their guidelines for the use of wild mammals in research, where they state, and they state in italics for emphasis, that any activity involving the capture of wild mammals should be subject to review by an IACUC to determine whether the activity meets this regulatory definition of a field study, and if not uh, found to be exempt, then to provide appropriate oversight for the use of wild mammals in that type of research. And the take home here is that it is the oversight body that's making the decision, not the investigator. So there's an additional level of, of review of this. The second term that causes a lot of confusion is the term euthanasia. And I think it's actually more problematic in my estimation for many reasons. First, because it's so commonly used in ways that are not consistent with its definition and its use in the AVMA guidelines for euthanasia. Um, and second, because much of the time, the taking of animal lives in wildlife research would really be more consistent with examples of lethal take or humane killing than they would euthanasia. That is not to say that these methods should not be used as in as humane a manner as possible. They should, but that because of the numbers of animals involved, the mechanisms of capture, or perhaps the conditions under which the animals are collected, 
that, that these circumstances would not permit the investigator to use methods of death that would meet the conditions of euthanasia as prescribed by the AVMA guidelines. But the real challenge and where, where it hits the road for field researchers comes when the language in these guidance documents and in other guidance documents, in policies and in regulations do not recognize these other terms, specifically lethal take and humane killing. The term always used is euthanasia. And because these other terms are not, are not used in those documents, the result is that oversight bodies that are more familiar with captive environments and where similar limitations simply do not exist for domesticated animals, they feel that they lack the ability to approve these other mechanisms of humane death. And for the investigator in a field situation, this may be the best alternative that they have available to them. Great, thank you, Bob, that was great. Um, Bill, do you wanna jump in here? Do you have anything to add to what Bob has said? Yeah, I think the only thing that I would add and we'll get into that a little bit more uh, down the road, is the need to provide some clarification uh, at your institutions to your IACOOKs or, and or to work with the field biologists to understand these terms. That's the kind of thing that's gonna make it much easier for your IACOOK to accept this terminology. Um, I, I think that that's the critical piece. And as we uh, continue through our session here, We'll get into that a little bit more when, when Michael talks a little bit about protocols, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the regulations and the standards and, and applying them. So with that, Ann, I'll, I'll let us move on to, to Michael if he has any comments and uh, the next set of questions. Thank you, Bill. Please, Michael. Thank you. I, I uh, agree wholeheartedly. It's an interesting challenge. Uh, I guess I use the term harvest sampling sometimes where it really gets interestingly sticky because in those cases, um, it's even questionable where the ICOC needs to be involved because the animals are technically being harvested for food uh, one way or another. And the investigator um, isn't doing the harvesting necessarily, um, but they may be sampling as the animals are, are going into the process of being dead. Um, in fisheries, for example, uh, collecting samples on uh, large vessels that are, are essentially doing factory uh, processing at sea. So they're individually quick freezing animals uh, rapidly in, a, in an automated process and you're sampling there is that any different than, than taking necropsy samples on already dead animals? Or if, uh, as often happens uh, in normal hunting harvest, uh, animals will be uh, available to researchers to take samples after they've been hunted. Um, an interesting problem, uh, but possibly one that maybe even the ICUC doesn't need to worry about. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, I'm actually gonna stick with you. So uh, if we have time at the end, we can certainly talk about, you know, maybe some ways to address some of these in, in terms of some, you know, how to fix it kind of things. I think we heard a little bit from the two of you, but uh, three of you, but hopefully we can get in maybe a little bit to, you know, what we ex aspire to come out of this workshop and maybe some of these uh, kinds of things could be part of that. But Michael, I want to stick with you and talk, um, I want to ask, you know, a, a significant challenge faced by researchers and IACOOKs um, is the difficulties they may have finding and using expertise and information needed to develop and evaluate wildlife research protocols. So could you comment on this a little bit and provide some thoughts about how we might overcome this challenge? That's a good question because they're actually at least, you know, every IACOOK is for a different institution and some institutions have so much biomedical research going on, um, they hardly have time to fit in a, a wildlife project or something in their uh, go. But other places um, have it more frequently. I, I'd say one thing that could be uh, 
very valuable is for IACUCs to find uh, sort of a consultant that could come in. If, if they don't see many wildlife or fisheries type studies and they, they have one to look at, they could uh, possibly identify somebody either in their own institution or even outside their institution, be willing to consult with them about um, what the people are proposing. I think it's better uh, whether you have a large biomedical uh, processing going on in your IACUC or not to actually try to recruit uh, somebody from fisheries, wildlife background. Uh, there's um, a, a bunch of disciplines that all work on wild animals. And if you were able to, as an IACUC, bring somebody on board uh, who's either been interested enough had some act interactions with the IACUC before who might join the IACUC as a member, um, that person becomes almost instantly a resource for all the rest of the people in the university that are doing that kind of work. And they can do quite a bit of outreach in a way and helping people. I, I've spent some time doing this and, and um, it's often a matter of just calming people down and say, they, they don't mean to make you mad. They're, just, they're asking this because of this. And yeah, they don't mean to tell you the wrong ways to do it because that sometimes comes about through people's misunderstanding of, of um, how things are done in the field and how they have to be done in the field. So um, my, my biggest thought here is to um, try to get somebody um, in to look at this occasional uh, uh, protocol you might have, or if you, if you do have uh, ecology people and people that would be involved in these sorts of studies at your university, actually recruiting somebody with that expertise um, to come aboard and help um, ease the pain for those that aren't uh, as familiar with it. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, Bob, do you wanna add anything to this? Well, I, I will just echo exactly what Michael said. Getting people with those, those types of expertise on the IACUC is a huge, huge advantage. If, if you're a field researcher and you feel that the IACUC is not understanding the field protocols, then you need to be on that IACUC or you or, or a, a field colleague. Um, the one thing that I would add is Another great resource is to reach out to the taxon societies, particularly to their animal care and use committees um, for the society. I think for all societies, the individuals that are on those committees, or at least the chair is listed on websites, contact that chair, either via email or phone and ask them. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to be able to answer your question, but these people have their entire professional societies at their fingertips. They're pretty well cognizant of who's doing what. And if they can't find someone that has expertise and background with that activity or with that species, I would be really surprised. They, they can find someone at least closely um, aligned with that. So I, I welcome people to contact me as uh, co-chair of the uh, Mammal Society's Animal Care and Use Committee. And realistically, I probably feel somewhere between two and four questions weekly on these types of, of issues. And I refer them to many other uh, mammalogists as well. That's a really great suggestion. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Bill, do you want to add anything? No, I don't think anything specific. I think uh, Michael and Bob are, are, are spot on. Um, and one of the things I'll talk about in a little bit is the idea of reaching out to the right resources um, especially if you're at an institution that has a very strong biomedical program. So I'll hold some comments till, till a little bit later, Ann. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to stick with you, Bill. Sure. So, um, some of the discussions over the last couple of days have pointed out potential limitations to animal welfare guidance as it relates to wildlife. Um, a good example uh, is the AVMA guidance. Mm -hmm. um, could you discuss a little bit about how this guidance is or should be evolving and in the meantime, how we might use that guidance in the interim? 
Sure, happy to, and thank you. I think just to give a little background, and, and I know that most of us that are participating in today's workshop uh, are familiar with the animal programs at our own institutions. But if you take a look at the guide and the Animal Welfare Act and the AVMA guidelines, particularly the guide, wildlife is only mentioned 23 times. The Animal Welfare Act regulations, wildlife is mentioned 19 times. And then when you get to the AVMA guidelines, there is a section on wildlife and it kind of leaves um, euthanasia, humane killing open to the institutions I cook to interpret and figure out what's gonna work best for their institution in a particular situation. Uh, if you get to the end of that particular session or section on euthanasia, it, it basically says as long as the method proposed is uh, meeting current uh, advancements and it minimizes the risk to the animal from a welfare standpoint, then it's fair game for the eye cook to consider and use. And it's obviously something that our wildlife biologists are using. I, I think one thing that I'll say about the regulations in general is, is they were developed for institutions to read and interpret. Um, every eye cook has an interpretation the theme behind all the regulations are, of course, uh, to minimize the use of animals to what's needed to prove uh, a hypothesis and or um, ensure the humane care and welfare of those animals. So having said that, when you think about an institution and the things that are going on there, if, for example, the institution is very heavy in biomedical, then the mindset of that IACUC is biomedical. So it's not uncommon for a new protocol to come in from a wildlife biologist and an eye cook in general, if not given some guidance on wildlife, to try to apply the things they've always done. You know, how can you look at cervical dislocation uh, in the field and say that it's 100% acceptable when for a laboratory mouse, it's not necessarily the first method of euthanasia that's preferred but again, it may be completely opposite when you're dealing with a field situation. So one of the things that I think is critical that, that both Bob and Michael focused on is that idea of getting the right people on your committee, maybe not as a permanent member. If you've got field biologists at your institution, certainly get them on as permanent members, one or two. They can offer a lot of expertise, but if not, resources is critical. You've got to contact folks at the taxon groups. Bob has already offered. He's been doing it actively for years. I know I had a protocol myself. I'm at University of Michigan, a lot of biomedical stuff. I said, hey, Bob, what do you do when you got this critter or that critter? You surely can't capture these the way we capture mice. So one of the things that I want to say is when you're, when you're sitting down, especially if you've got uh, minimal wildlife research at your institution, Developing some guidance documents for your IACUC is critical. It will remind them that what they're doing is different than working with a mouse or working with a laboratory rat. It will remind them to call Bob. It will remind them to call Michael as a field biologist and it will help us to get the right folks in. Um, I, th I think that's critical. So as we sit down and develop protocols and processes, um, that general guidance could help us tremendously if you're at a large biomedical institution. Um, one thing that Bob has always told me and I live by it is every species of animal in the field, every type of research you're doing uh, in the field may offer you a unique challenge. So you're not gonna streamline and write everything down and be able to follow these documents you know, A to Z. You're still gonna need those uh, uh, field biologists and folks from the other organizations to help. I, I think the moral of the story with the regulations is there's a lot of flexibility in the things that you use as an institution uh, religiously, the guide, the AVMA guidelines and the um, Animal Welfare Act regulations. You may be at an institution where your primary research portfolio is wildlife and you got this all figured out. Well, if you do jump in there and help uh, the biomedical industry to streamline some of the things they're doing as well. Um, it's going to make it a lot easier for your colleagues in the field and a lot easier for those of us that 
that are working on a regular basis um, in the biomedical industry. So I think, Ann, that hits on the primary points I wanted to hit on. I, again, you know, always open for specific questions. Uh, I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds, but it, it does address some of the points that you've asked about. Great. Thank you, Bill. That was great. Uh, Bob, do you want to add anything to this? Well, I, I think Bill brought up some very key points here. Um, making sure that your IACA knows that this flexibility is there is super critical. And if you have an IACA where the vast majority of your portfolio is in fact biomedical, it's easy to snap back or, or to, to relax back into that familiar territory where everything is euthanasia. So having a committee member that's got that wildlife expertise and reminds people that okay, what we're looking at in, with this form of capture is lethal take or, or humane killing if we're dispatching these animals in the field. That changes the mindset. Um, so, and it reminds the ICUC that they do have that flexibility. Similarly, I think that another key point is that when the institution develops its protocol forms, that the protocol forms used for wildlife studies, solicit these types of, of uh, information, th these types of data points so that the ICUC can review them. So if the, if the um, protocol form specifically is talking about forms of humane killing or euthanasia, that also gets the IACUC to, to change that mindset and they have to really be thinking about flexibility to match the species and to match the environments. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Michael, you wanna add anything to this? Oh, just a couple of things. I, I really liked uh, your use of the word evolving understanding uh, and when you introduced this, because I, I think it's important to, for everybody the IACUCs and the people applying to the IACUCs to understand that uh, less is known than is unknown, particularly when we get into the broad diversity of species that we're dealing with when we talk about fisheries and wildlife and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then I think it's important to know that what's known is often found to be wrong later as people uh, do more work. And um, there actually are, are three documents that the AVMA, uh, that the AVMA uh, puts effort into. The, the uh, two that are more recent are about um, harvest and um, deal with field issues. And, and those, all three documents are constantly under revision. Uh, they, they have periodic complete revisions, but if somebody that's involved with the review of those documents discovers something, something might get changed actively in the middle. And, um, so I think it's important for IACUCs to understand that, that uh, there can be um, more to learn, so to speak. Uh, one that I, I just thought I'd kick in here, well, two of them actually, I wanted to bring up the anesthesia of fishes and that's becoming a very complex issue as we discover that the drugs that everybody considers um, humane on their own really probably aren't functionally humane for euthanasia, they're a second method, uh, cervical uh, in, uh, dis destruction of the uh, brainstem, something like that needs to be done secondary. So that's coming along. And then one of my favorites was uh, an experience I went through with uh, a field team that was doing opossum. Well, among, they were, they were clearing large territories to see how fast predators came back. They're just basically reproving what was already known is that only about 25% of young uh, mammals actually survived <laughs> to the first year. And in that they had asked for what to use in uh, euthanizing of possums. And I just looked in the guideline and there it was, and I told them, and, and I got a call rapidly uh, in the first year there saying, well, this isn't working. And I started calling everybody. We had said before, you should call people. And everybody told me the same answer. And it was the answer I had given the team in the field. And I began to wonder about that. And that um, was 
peppered with stories about how interesting it was that occasionally opossums were waking up in the necropsy cooler after they'd been euthanized. Um, so I, I went to work with a, an anesthesiologist friend of mine and we actually did a study and we discovered that they're really hard to kill. They require a massive dose uh, of pentobarbital um, IV in order to get them down. Once we figured out that opossums were super animals, uh, everything became calmer in the field and, and it all got taken care of. But what was really important was even internationally, I tried to find that out. We just didn't know yet. We had to do the work to figure it out. Thank you all. That was a uh, really insightful discussion. I appreciate that. Um, so for our next question, Bob, um, the oversight of wildlife research can fall under many different umbrellas, levels of government, federal agencies, other types of organizations. And some of the challenges we have with wildlife animal welfare does relate to jurisdictional limits, which can often result in differences, gaps, ambiguities, even contradictions in regulations and in guidance. Can you talk some about this and maybe provide some suggestions for how we can overcome this? Oh, give it a try. Um, first off, it really is not, or at least it, it should not be surprising that these jurisdictional limits exist. After all, the regulation of wildlife and even exploration of biodiversity originally had economics at its core. Next, after that, we see development of a structure that's really designed to protect these natural populations as resources. This is the framework that still exists and requires investigators to obtain permits and to comply with the applicable laws for the use of animals in whatever part, state, or country they happen to be working in. The various governmental agencies and organizations focus on ethical and appropriate use of these animals in research and education came about only after these other components were in place. And they came about as problems were identified or as particular interests or disciplines developed. In short, the structure that we currently have, particularly as it relates to wildlife, absolutely was not conceived and developed for the purpose of integrating oversight and the use of wildlife into research and education. It came after the fact. Despite that, despite these diverse reasons for uh, which these agency structures and guidance documents were developed, at this point, we really have many of the necessary components in place, I feel, for a giant leap forward. What we're really lacking is a framework that effectively integrates these diverse parts. This, frankly, is where I think the taxon guidelines came into being. These documents were developed to address many of the gaps that exist between the guide for care and use of laboratory animals and what is reality for wildlife research. In other words, they, fo they focus on aspects like capture and handling, options for the most humane death practical under these diverse situations and with diverse species, and many of the specifics that must be considered if these animals are to be maintained in captivity. So these taxon guidelines were never intended to provide information on how oversight committees were to operate and, and the like like that, but they were instead intended to refine, to fine tune the procedures and the oversight expectations of committees for wild vertebrates. So these documents that were, were developed to fill this niche should be explicitly recognized as appropriate references for the investigators, for ICUCs, and for anyone needing specifics about how to fit wild animals into this overarching framework. But that level of recognition also comes with a necessity to ensure that these taxon guidelines are kept current and that they're thoroughly peer reviewed. And also remember that these taxon guidelines were, were developed by taxon experts, but they were, they were developed also largely without input from other professions. And these other professions have very relevant insights to offer. When you develop ideas in an echo chamber, your product tends to be one dimensional. And I have found with the Mammal Society, for instance, that adding wildlife veterinarians to the ASM's Animal Care and Use Committee has added 
really valuable information that was lacking from previous versions because these professionals view the subject animals and the animal activities through different lenses. And I encourage other taxon societies to consider similar additions to their committees. Okay, now let's go up to the next level of integration. And what we have there is effectively the Guide for Care and Use of Laboratory Animals, OLA, and the USDA, uh, APHIS. Now in lumping these together for the sake of this discussion, I recognize the different scope and the missions of each of these. However, the common theme is that each was built around a focus really on biomedical research conducted in laboratories. And that means that the extension of guidance in these policies and regulations to wildlife was added later, and it was often added awkwardly. Smoothing the fit of wildlife activities into that language from each of these and simultaneously directing investigators and oversight bodies to wildlife specific resources would go far, in my opinion, in mitigating many of the challenges. Now, uh, it's a fair question to ask if, since this was an ad hoc approach, shouldn't we just start over and start from scratch and create a purpose-built system? At this point, I think such a proc uh, process would really be like reinventing the wheel. I consider it far more cost-effective and direct to modify the components that we already have available rather than starting over. But using available components means that we have to alter each of those components to join them into a cohesive whole. So this is going to take a collaborative approach and it's going to take collaboration across entities and across units that typically haven't collaborated. Sounds like a big job. <laughs> uh, Michael, you wanna to add to this? Thank you, Bob. That does sound like a big job. And, and actually I agree with everything Bob was talking about. I immediately stepped out of the box, which seems to be where I like to be. And, and in some cases, IACUCs are trying to be all things to all people. And they're actually trying to enforce and deal with things that are uh, essentially, as, as I think Bob, you call them business things. I mean, uh, they actually have nothing to do with um, animal care and use as much as they have to do with um, economics and uh, country relations and this sort of thing. And I, I think it's easy for a, a wildlife investigator, particularly one who's doing international work, to find themselves trapped in an incredible um, problem of an IACUC wanting everything in place first as they um, create the document that will allow them to submit to get funded when they can't actually get things from agencies until something's going to happen and, and is to me a case of um, IACUCs getting involved with things that are technically outside the purview of the IACUC. They don't have to try to uh, regulate endangered species, for example. There's agencies that do that and there's permits and CITES permits and, and all of those are complex and, and even just moving samples, for example. So for me, um, I, I think everything that Bob said, yes, and that's enough work to keep everybody busy. And then uh, possibility of uh, making IACUCs aware that they don't have to regulate everything in the world. They should stick with animal care and use. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Bill, do you have anything to add here? Uh, yeah, really quick. I, I think one of the critical things to talk about is the folks that are in the biomedical world may not know where these, I'm gonna call them tools are. So Bob has mentioned many, many different things that will serve our community as tools as we figure out some of this wildlife research. I mean, I'm gonna pick on a protocol for a minute and say this, you know, if we sit down as an IACUC and we want, you know, all the I's dotted, the T's crossed, and we wanna put a bow on it when we're done, the thing that we need to think about is some of the things that may happen downstream. So let's use as an example, uh, somebody that's gonna do a fisheries survey, uh, looking at different species in a river um, let's, for the sake of argument, say it's NSF funded, now it falls under OLAW, uh, 
So now all of a sudden we're trying to write a protocol that, that meets all of the expectations um, of a biomedical project. Well, if you think about the IACUC, if it's just surveys, we may think, all right, we don't need to euthanize these fish unless of course there's vouchers, let's say there isn't. So now we're doing some electroshocking or we're doing some netting. We're in Florida or South Carolina. We come up with some exotic fish, uh, snakeheads. So now the PIs are sitting on a boat with an IACUC protocol that says no euthanasia. And they've got a permit in their hand that says, if you catch any snakeheads, you can't return them to the waterways. So now as an institution, we've set up a no-win situation for our PIs. So remember, we talked about flexibility. You know, this is where IACUCs can write a line in their protocol that says, you know, we don't expect any euthanasia unless under certain circumstances of a permit, a state regulation or something like that, it's required. So we can think outside of the box, like Michael said, IACUCs can ensure the welfare of animals. IACUCs can ensure, you know, the minimum numbers are being met, our three R's issues. But in the same breath, we can build in the flexibility that the PIs need to do their studies in the field. MS-222, uh, Michael mentioned that. You know, it may be the, the, the best anesthesia for zebrafish, but if you're gonna do something with a rainbow trout in the field, you're not gonna be able to use MS-222 and release it back into a trout stream that Bob's gonna be fishing in next week. So you gotta be able to think about some of that. And we really need IACUCs to understand they can do their job and they need to do their job, but there are some certain limitations related to wildlife that's gonna be driven by a permit, a state law, a field regulation or something like that. So I think with everything that, that that, that Michael and Bob said with this particular question, those are some of the critical things that we need to remember from a regulatory standpoint and from an IACUC review and approval standpoint. That's great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, I've got a question for you. Okay. So, um, you know, we've already discussed several challenges related to animal welfare and wildlife research and education. And, you know, there've been many that have been discussed, um, you know, over the last two days, but which challenges, which additional challenges we haven't covered yet today, do you think are, are really important to mention here that we should talk about here? Yeah, that, that's an interesting and a tough question. Uh, it made me think that I tended to think uh, about dealing with wildlife experts all the time when the IACUC's getting a proposal. And that's not necessarily always the case. And then I was trying to think about, uh, there's certainly been, and some of our colleagues that spoke through the meeting talked about, there's certainly been a lot of controversy about surgical techniques and, and what's appropriate to use. And, and there are issues across species and lots of issues, um, but it's fairly straightforward for most IACOCs to include some sort of you had to have learned how to do surgery somehow um, for somebody to be allowed to do surgery on an animal. Uh, it varies from IACUC to IACUC, but it uh, can be quite elaborate. In fact, uh, having them observed in their technique and this sort of thing. And I got to thinking about simple things like trapping, which aren't at all simple. And, um, the worst case scenario would be somebody who hasn't really trapped before and an IACUC who has no experience in trapping, advising on trapping. And they're almost inevitably, every experience I've had, they recommend really bad things uh, because they think humane traps are humane. Uh, they only are named that. <laughs> they're only good for certain uses. And sometimes, uh, certainly in the uh, veterinary community, there's been this constant battle the ABMA has dealt with is about leg hold traps. And every once in a while, a group of 50 veterinarians somewhere gets together and says, they're evil. And the AVMA says, yeah, we won't allow them. And then those of us in the AVMA who know better have to kind of, wait a minute, let's talk about this again. And over a couple of years, it gets straightened out. Well, what that brought me to is um, 
maybe there should be some sort of similar requirement as far as trapping skill sets and those things go because they're not trivial. Uh, an expert trapper, if you work with an expert trapper in the field, you'll be blown away about how much care they take um, properly sizing the trap, uh, setting the uh, lines appropriately. And generally when it's done well, you have almost never an injury. They occur sometimes, but almost never an injury. You may lose some animals out of the trap, but uh, good trappers are amazing. So I, I was thinking, well, wouldn't it be reasonable for ICUX to consider some sort of similar educational requirement for people who are gonna go out and trap? Um, and that's where I got kind of stuck mentally. I thought that was really um, <laughs> the key thing I got hooked onto. But when you think about it, it, it really relates to a lot of areas. Um, when we were first starting to do our sturgeon work, um, we tried to have uh, the um, biologists and stuff trained to use uh, anesthetics. And we found that uh, for the simple placement of a tag, that was just a lethal exercise for sturgeon. Uh, the, the very short, put the tag there and let the fish go, 100% survival, you know, everything fine, no infections once we studied it, but try to anesthetize them, dead sturgeon. So um, I think it's important to um, understand the need for those skill sets for the people that are doing wildlife work and not necessarily assume that everybody has them, but also at the same time recognize that they're different. Great, thank you, Michael, that was great. Uh, Bill, do you want to add to this? Um, I, I think there's a lot of different things that, that will come up as institutions go along and it's really gonna require some conversation I think Michael's point about uh, educating um, the field biologists on trapping, you know, I would advocate that we educate the IACUC on trapping if you've got a lot of uh, that going on at your institution and not just trapping. But I mean, the other point Michael was spot on was sometimes it's just better off to put the tag in the sturgeon and release it than calling and anesthetizing probably going to cause more problems than the short period a fin snip or you know a, a tag so uh, i think that a lot of these things that we as institutions create um, as challenges are simply because we're not willing to think we are trying to to take something that we don't even know if it's painful to put a tag in a sturgeon or not but call it that and then create even more potential problems for that fish. So I think just being insightful and um, encouraging IACUCs to, to really think about these wildlife protocols and think outside the box and not say, well, let's put fur and ears on this sturgeon and try and figure out what's best for it. So that, that would be my, the only thing that I would add to, to Michael's comments. The, Good points, Michael, all the way. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Bob, challenges you'd like to identify? Well, I got to say, Michael's uh, example sure fit home. He probably doesn't know that I was a trapper long before I became a scientist and a mammalogist. So that, that is actually where I started. Um, that's one of the things that led me into field biology. But one of the challenges that I see coming down the road, actually, that's here now, is that ICUX investigators, oversight bodies need to realize that there really is a gradation between lab studies and studies of totally free ranging animals. We now have enclosures that are very, very large um, for lots of different species. So at what point does an animal in a large enclosure become a free ranging animal as opposed to a captive animal? So these are gradations that that really takes some wrestling with. Um, and the, the same thing holds with, with if the enclosure is with animals that came from that area or perhaps species that occur there naturally but came from a different area. So the same species, 
but you brought them in from a different area. At what point is it a free ranging animal in its natural environment? So there are challenges interpreting many of these terms and many of these subtleties. Thank you. So I want to wrap us up here, um, really talking about opportunities and what might happen, what we might see come out of this workshop. I think we've we've identified um, many challenges over the last couple of days, and certainly in this this session, uh, and we've also identified many opportunities. And so I guess I just want to open this up to you and say, you know, what what would you like to see as the outcome of of this, you know, great two days of of knowledge gathering that we have. And so Bill, I, I wanna start with you and just see what would you like to see come out of this? Sure. Yeah, I think, and one of the key things that you said was opportunities. So we've really learned a lot over the last couple of days uh, of things that we can do to, to help recognize some of the differences between wildlife studies and other studies. Um, I think that IACUCs can take one of the next steps I think that's gonna be critical. Um, if I just go back to, to Bob's little session on terminology, um, you know, we can't write a policy for everything, but we surely can write something that says, um, and this is referring to what Bob said, that the IACUC should be aware of all the studies that involve wildlife, and they should make a decision on whether a policy is involved or not. Said that, they need to understand some of the terminology and some of the challenges. Otherwise, it's a vertebrate animal. IACUC policy is let's do a protocol. You know, maybe OLAW is going to tie our hands if it's an NSF study. You need a protocol no matter what. But what does it look like? So I think one of the things that I would like to see uh, us do as a community is to think outside of the box and start thinking about some of the challenges that are directly related to wildlife studies. If you think about biomedical research, and especially if you're involved in that, you already know that we knocked all the low apples off the tree, and now we're trying to knock the high apples off. So we're trying to find all these things that are unique and may only happen at one institution or maybe once in a career. If we would just spend a little bit of that time focusing as a community and as an IACUC on some of the low hanging fruit for wildlife studies, I think it would help us understand the unique challenges, how to write a protocol, you know, how to work with a national park agency or a state U.S. Uh, or a state fish and game commission, and some of the challenges associated that the PIs have to face when IACUCs get really, really strict on what a protocol looks like. So I think the IACUC needs to learn to burden some of the challenges that our wildlife biologists take on. So I know we're starting to push for time and so I'll kick it back to you to give uh, Bob and Michael a chance to, uh, to chime in too. Great, thank you, Bill. Uh, Michael, what would you like to see come out of this workshop? It, it's fairly redundant, but I do think uh, the issue is working together. And I do think it is flexibility. And I think it's taking advantage of the flexibility that actually was provided originally in the laws that uh, allow for exactly uh, what uh, Bill was talking about just now. And, and I'm gonna say it also in, includes the construction of facilities at the university to house animals in-house. Um, you probably ought to get somebody who knows what they're doing in there before you spend a million dollars building a completely intolerable place for what you're planning to put in there. Um, just a suggestion. Thank you, Michael. And Bob, you get the last word. What would you like to see out of this? Hey, well, Michael's comments there seem, sound like they're from experience. Um, so, <laughs> you know, when I look over it from a, a 30,000 foot perspective, with few exceptions, I believe that the diverse entities we have touched on, uh, that we have touched over the, the these last couple of days all share a um, common theme of promoting ethical and appropriate interactions with wild animals that are used in research and education. We've heard from diverse speakers who have come at this goal from different perspectives with different backgrounds and with different biases, but we all share that common goal. These differing perspectives, backgrounds, and biases really are all important 
because we're talking about animals that belong to the public, not to individuals or to individual institutions. So what this really means is that we've got to get away from this silo approach to oversight and we've got to be more willing to see the challenges from different perspectives. Given the threats facing wild populations globally, because of factors like changing land use patterns, human encroachment, and environmental impacts, our time available for addressing these obstacles is running short. Folks, it's time for a collegial and interactive approach to wildlife. Well, those are great, great parting words, Bob. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bob, Bill, Michael, for your insights. This has been a really great discussion and I appreciate you all sharing your expertise. Uh, I also wanna thank our audience for attending. And I do wanna remind folks that um, immediately following this, uh, this session, we will have our second wrap up session uh, with the moderators of the day to talk about what the most interesting and challenging uh, questions and uh, topics came out of, uh, of our day's discussion. So with that, thank you all very much. And um, I appreciate your attention. Thanks everybody.